once again, this is Uncle Jimmy with Jimmy's Train Station and Travel Adventures. And today it is November the 30th, 2022, last day of November. It's a dreary, wet day today. I hope you all had a wonderful Thanksgiving holiday. Uh, I know me and my family did. My wife and kids did a real good uh, job at cooking a meal for her uh side of the family and uh really enjoyed it um they did a really good job so i hope you and yours had a great thanksgiving holiday dinner also but uh being a wet and dreary day <clears throat> i do a lot of research to find interesting stories and, and as you know i do do history stories now and then so i figured this would be a good video to do being uh, the end of the fall season and getting ready to go into Christmas season before I start filming and doing Christmas videos and things of Christmas. Um, this is a, a sad story to do. Um, very sad story that I'm getting ready to tell you. And it happened in the 1700s right outside of Gettysburg in uh, what's known as the Marsh Creek Settlement. Now, Marsh Creek covers a lot of area, not only in Gettysburg, but down toward Chambersburg, and that's where we're at. We're near Chambersburg, Pennsylvania. Um, now, if you want to come and see this yourself, I'm going to show you a statue of a famous pioneer girl that was 12 years old, and I'm going to tell her story. And it's located 30, you take 30, Route 30 West out of Gettysburg toward Chambersburg, and it's right before Mr. Ed's. It's Route 234 to the right, right before Mr. Ed's. And then the very next road is called Church Road. And if you go up that road about two miles, you'll come to this uh, Catholic church here. It's called St. Inagus Loyal Catholic Church on Church Road. And the statue is right here in the cemetery and church parking lot. So, uh... Follow me on this adventure of this sad story of this uh, pioneer girl's life, and uh, I'll tell you the story about this young lady. So follow me. Okay, we'll begin this story. Before I show you her statue, now she actually has two statues, one here and one in New York State, and I'll explain that later. But I'm going to give you a little background of her story. Um, I got my papers here and did my research. This is the story of Mary Jemison, also known as Dehimanis, which means pretty girl in uh, Indian language. Um, and that's the um, Genesis language of the Seneca. And it's Dehimanis, meaning pretty girl. Uh, she was born in 1743 and died in September 19, 1833. She was a Scottish-Irish colonial frontiers woman in Pennsylvania and New York who became known as the White Woman of the Genesees. As a young girl, she was captured and adopted into the Seneca family, assimilating to, the, to their culture, marrying two Native American men in secession, and having children with them. In 1824, she published a memoir of her life, a form of captivity narrative. During the French and Indian War, in the spring of 1755, right here in this area where I'm at, in the uh, Marsh Creek settlement area where they settled, was Jemison. At the age of 12, was captured with most of her family in a Shawnee raid is what now known as Adams County, Pennsylvania. And this is where I live in Adams County. The others of her family were eventually killed. She and an unrelated young boy were adopted by Seneca families. She became fully assimilated, marrying a Delaware Lenape, and after his death, a Seneca man. She chose to remain a Seneca rather than return to the American colonial culture. Now, this might sound unusual and strange but uh after i read the story you'll understand why she decided to stay with the senecas 
Uh, Jemison told her story late in life to an American minister who wrote it for her. He published it as Narrative of the Life of Mrs. Mary Jemison in 1824. Now, you can get a reprint of this book and read it for yourself and her story and of her life. It was reprinted in the late 20th century. In 1874, her remains were reinterred near a historical Seneca council house on a private estate. And it was what known now as Letchworth State Park. And that's in New York. And that's where the reservation for the Seneca people were, where she would eventually uh, wind up. So let's get out and take a look at this uh, statue and memorial to her. And then I'll tell you the rest of her story. So follow me. So we are standing in uh, front of the statue in her likeness of Mary Jameson, the white squall stolen from Buckingham Valley by the Indians. And it says 1753, which is wrong. It's actually 1755, the date is. But right in this area where we're at, it's where she was captured. So this is a likeness of her when she was 12 years old. The statue here. And the plaque reads, it was erected in June of 1923 by Father Will Whalen, probably of this Catholic church here, which is right over here. It says, during the French and Indian War, Mary Jemison was kidnapped from this valley on April 5th, 1758, which was really 1755, by a band of Frenchmen and Shawnee Indians. Uh, she's taken to the fort... Uh, I'm not good with certain words. De Quince, I think it's pronounced, now Pittsburgh. She was adopted by the Seneca Indians who named her the Hegewanis, which means pretty girl, in 1759. They moved to the Genesee River Valley in the state of New York. During her life with the Indians, Mary married and gave birth to eight children. At the age of 91, she returned to her Christian faith and died a few days later on September 19, 1833 on the reservation of the Seneca. Mary called the white woman of the Genesee, grew to love and respect her captors. She is buried at what later become Lethworth State Park in Northwest New York State. This base stone, it says right here, from the Jameson Homestead, erected by William a and son Richard M. Cole in 1923, plaque donated and placed in 2006 by Richard C. Edwin M. and James M. Cole. So that's interesting. This base here, right here, these rocks were taken from the Jemison uh, home here in the valley where she was kidnapped. I'd really like to know where that home is, or or I'd show you if I. Maybe I can do a little research and do a second story to this and find out where her homestead actually was. Which it had to be close to this spot because this is her statue right here and this is the valley that we're in. Um, so that's very interesting. I didn't know that. It says it was taken from the Jameson homestead. So it'd be neat to find out where that homestead is. But uh, I'm going to leave a rock for respect of Mary right there on her statue. And uh, I'll tell you the rest of the story and, and her own words of what happened to her the day she was captured on April 5th, 1755 by the Shawnee. So follow us on this adventure. All right, folks, I'm going to give you the rest of the story of Mary Jemison. Uh, sit back and enjoy and listen, and I'll read off the research that I found and tell the rest of the story. Mary Jemison was born to Thomas and Jane Jemison aboard the ship William and Mary in the fall of 1743 while en route to British Ireland and today's Northern Ireland to America. So she was actually born on the Atlantic Ocean on her way to America when her family was migrating to the United States. They landed in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania and joined other Protestant Scottish-Irish immigrants in heading west to settle on cheaper available lands in the backcountry, what was then the western frontier, now central Pennsylvania. 
They squatted on territory that had been purchased by the Penn family in 1736 from chiefs of the Iroquois Confederacy, six nations that were based in central and western New York. The Jemisons had cleared land to develop their farm, and the couple had several children. By 1755, conflicts had started in the French and Indian War. The North American front of the Seven Years' War between France and Britain. Both sides made use of Native American allies, especially on the frontier areas where they had few regular forces. One morning in early 1755, a raiding party consisting of six Shawnee Indians and four Frenchmen captured Mary, the rest of her family except two older brothers and a young boy from another family. En route to French controlled Fort, I can't pronounce it, De Quince, I think it is, if I'm pronouncing it right. It's in present day Pittsburgh. I'm not good with these French words. The Shawnee killed Mary's mother, father, and siblings and ritually scalped them. Mary later learned that it was a Seneca custom when one of their own was killed or taken prisoner in battle to take an enemy up as prisoner or to take their scalp in the morning mooring ritual. Two Seneca women who had lost a brother in the French and Indian War a year before Mary's capture and in the mooring raid, morning raid, the Shawnee intended to capture a prisoner or obtain an enemy scalp to compensate them. The 12 year old Mary and the young boy were spared, likely because they were a suitable age for adoption. Once the party reached the fort, Mary was given to the two Seneca women who took her downriver to their settlement. After a short ceremony, a Seneca family adopted Mary, renaming her the Hewanis. Other nominations variants include the Hegawanis, the Hegawanis and Degawanis Dickawanis. She learned it's meant pretty a pretty girl, a handsome girl, or a pleasant good thing. When she came of age, Mary married a Delaware man named Synergy, who was living with the band. They had a son who she named Thomas after her father. Synergy took her on a seven hundred mile journey to the Shahang Shagana Gahana Valley along with the Genesee River in the present day western New York State. Although Jemison and her son reached this destination, her husband did not. While hunting one day on her journey, he was taken ill and died. As a widow, Mary and her children were taken into the Synergy's clan relatives. She made her home at Little Beardstown, where present day Collerville, New York later developed. She married again to a Seneca named Hikatu, and together they had six children, Nancy, Polly, Betsy, Jane, John, and Jesse. Interesting that she kept the Christian names, I might say, from her uh, white heritage. John had a troubled life. He killed his brother Thomas in 1811, then killed his brother Jesse in 1812, and later was also killed. This is a sad story because I heard that that brother also in the uh during the times when they were on the reservation they would get odd jobs you know with the the white people but but uh he uh also would get in a lot of bar fights and and confrontations so it's kind of a sad story to her kids ended up this way and him killing killing his brother it's a sad story and his two brothers he killed. And during the American Revolutionary War, the Seneca allied with the British, hoping that a British victory would enable them to expel the encroaching uh, colonists. Jemison's account of her life includes observations of this time. She and others in the Seneca town helped supply Joseph Brant, he was Mohawk, and his Iroquois warriors from various nations who fought the rebel colonists. So, you know, she had a very interesting life. I had I had to tell this story because I found it very interesting that I found this uh, researching on the web. 
After the war, the British ended their holdings east of the Mississippi River to the United States without consulting their Native American allies, the Seneca were forced to give up their lands to the United States. In 1797, the, the Seneca told much of their land as Little Beard's towns to Americans. At the time, during negotiations with, negotiations with the Holland Land Company held at Genesco, New York, Mary Jemison proved to be an able negotiator for the Seneca tribe. She helped win more favorable terms for surrendering their rights to the land of the treaty, a big tree, in 1797. Late in life, Jemison told her story to a minister, James E. Seaver, who published it as a narrative of the life of Mrs. Mary Jemison. 1824, uh, latest edition was 1967. It is considered a classic captivity narrative, although some early readers thought that the Seaver must have imposed his own beliefs. Since the late 20th century, many history scholars have thought the memorial is a re reasonable account of Jemison's life story and attitude. By staying with the Seneca, she showed that she preferred life with the Seneca to what she had seen of the lives of the colonial British women. In 1823, the Seneca sold most of their remaining land in that area except for two acres tract of land reserved for Jemison's use, known as the local European-American residence of the white women of the Genesees. Jemison lived on the tract for several years, in 1831, she sold it and moved to the Buffalo Creek Reservation, where some Seneca lived. Others had gone to an Ontario, Canada, and Jemison died on September 19, 1833, at the age of 90. She was initially buried on the Buffalo Creek Reservation. Jemison's heirs later changed her surname to Jemerson and established the community of Jemerson Town, on the Allegheny Indian Reservation. Now, um, I'm going to give her account, before we end this story, of what happened the day she was captured. So this is her account of her capture. The party that took us consisted of six Indians and four Frenchmen, who immediately commenced plundering, as I just observed, and took what they considered most valuable, consisting principally of bread, meal, and meat, Having taken as much provision as they could carry, they set out with their prisoners in great haste for the fear of detection and soon entered the woods. So if you can see here, we're, we're in a valley in the mountains, which would be easy for the Indians to come down out of the hills and do this and capture a, a settlement or, or a colonial family. On our march that day, an Indian went behind us with a whip with which he frequently lashed the children to make them keep up. In this manner, we traveled till dark without a mouthful of food or a drop of water. Also, we had not eaten since the night before. Whenever the children cried for water, the Indians would make them drink. Um, before, I, before I go on with this story, it gets kind of uh, from PG to rated R, so... If you can't stomach or, or this offends you in any way, please uh, turn off the video now. But if you want to hear the rest of the story, uh, uh, continue watching because it is an interesting story. So what they did is uh, they made them drink their own urine or go thirsty. At night, they encamped in the woods without fire and without shelter where we were marched with the greatest vigilance. Extremely fatigued and very hungry, we were compelled to lie upon the ground without supper or a drop of water to satisfy, satisfy the cravings of our appetite. As in the daytime, so the little ones were made to drink urine in the night if they cried for water. Fatigue alone brought us little sleep for the refreshment of our weary limbs. And at the dawn of day, we were again started on the march in the same order that had, we had proceeded the day before. Wow, this is, uh, I couldn't imagine. I couldn't imagine what her, her and her family went through. About sunrise, we were halted, and the Indian gave us a full breakfast of provision that they had brought from my father's house. Each of us, being very hungry, partook in the bounty of the Indians except father, 
who was so much overcome with his situation, so much exhausted by anxiety and grief, that silent despair seemed fa fastened upon his countenance. And he could not be pre prevailed upon to refresh his sinking nature by the use of morsel or food. Our repast being finished, we again resumed our march and before noon passed a small fort that I heard my father say was called Fort Kenajo uh, Jiggy. I'm not sure where that's at. That was the only time that I heard him speak from the, that time we were taken until we were finally separated the following night. Toward evening, we arrived at the border of dark and a dense swamp, which was covered with small hemlocks or some other evergreens and various kinds of bushes to which we were conducted and having gone a short distance, we stopped to encamp for the night. Here we had some bread and meat for supper but the dreariness of the situation together with the uncertainty under which we all labored to our future destiny almost deprived us of the sense of hunger and destroyed our rush for food. As soon as I had finished my supper, an Indian took off my shoes and stockings and put a pair of moccasins on my feet, which my mother observed and believing that they would spare my life even if they would destroy the other captives, address me as near as I can remember in the following words. My dear little Mary, I fear that that time has arrived when we must be parted forever. Your life, my child, I think will be spared, but we shall probably be tomahawked here in the lonesome place by the Indians. Oh, how can I part with you, my darling? What will become of my sweet little Mary? Oh, how can I think of your being con continued in captivity without a hope of your being rescued. Oh, that death has snatched you from my embraces in your infancy. The pain of parting that would have been pleasing to what it is now is, and I should have seen the end of your troubles. I lost my dear, my heart bless, bleeds as the thought of what awaits you. But if you leave us, remember, my child, your own name and the names of your father and mother. Be careful not to forget your English tongue. If you shall have an opportunity to get away from the Indians, don't try to escape, for if you do, they will find and destroy you. Don't forget, my little daughter, the prayers that I have learned you. Say them often. Be a good child, and God will bless you. May God bless you, my child, and make you comfortable and happy. So imagine that. Uh, her mother knew what was going to happen to them as a result of what they did by putting the moccasins on Mary's feet. The Indian led us some distance into the bushes or woods and there lay down us to spend the night. The recollection of partying with the, my tender mother kept me awake while my tears constantly flowed from my eyes. A number of times in the night, a little boy begged of me earnestly to run away with him and get clear of the Indians, but remembering the advice I had so lately received and knowing the dangers to which we would be, should be exposed in traveling without a path and without a guide through the wilderness unknown to us, I told him that I would not go and persuaded him to lie still till morning. My suspicion as to the fate of my parents proved too true, for soon after I left them they were viciously tomahawked to death and scalped. Together with Robert Matthew Betsy and the woman and her two children, and mangled in this most shocking manner. So, after a hard day march, we encamped in a thicket where the Indians made a shelter of bows and then built a good fire to warm and dry our benumbed limbs and clothing. For it had rained some through the day, here we were again fed and before. When the Indians had finished their supper, they took from their baggage a number of scalps and went about preparing them for the market or to keep them without spoiling. By straining them over small hoops, which they prepared for the purpose, and drying and scraping them by the fire. Having put the scalps yet the bloody, yet wet and bloody upon the hoops and stretched them to their full extent, they held them to the fire till they were partially dried, and then with their knives commenced scraping off the flesh. And in that way they continued to work alternately drying and scalping them, and scraping them. 
till they were dry and clean. That being done, they combed the hair in the neatest manner and then painted it and the edges of the scalp yet on the hoops red. Those scalps I knew at the time must have been taken from our poor family. By the color of the hair, my mother's hair was red, and I could easily distinguish my father's and the children's and babies from each other. The sight was most appalling and horrifying, yet I was obligated to endure it without complaining in the course of the night. They made me understand that they should not have killed the family if the whites had not pursued them. So there is uh, other books that you can uh, read uh, which are published. Uh, the Indian Cap to the Story of Mary Jemison, 1941 by Lois Linsky is one of the books. Um, there's another novel called Mary Jemison, White Wo Woman of the Seneca, which is published in 1996. It's a fictional version of Jemison's story. Deborah Larson's novel, The White, in 2002, is a fictional version of Jemison's life. And Gardner's book, Mary Jemison, Ending Captive. Original title, Mary Jemison, Seneca Captive, in 1966. And this is a fictionalized account for children to read. So, very intriguing, uh, interesting story of a young lady and what she went through. And uh, I do have a picture of what Mary looked like in 1892 uh, when she did her account uh, to the, the preacher who took a narrative of her story. And uh, she was 89 or 90 at the time. So this is a picture of her right here. Was an older lady. So, a uh, very interesting story. Um, I'd like to research this further and see if I can actually uh, find maybe the graves of her brothers that survived. They might even be buried in this old cemetery behind the church over here. I'm not sure. Um, and then I'd like to find the homestead, the original homestead where she was captured would be neat. Um, maybe I can do a little research and find that. Maybe not. But uh, I hope you've enjoyed this story of uh, Mary Jemison and, and her capture here in Pennsylvania. And very intriguing story. And uh, if you're watching this, please subscribe to my channel. Give it a thumbs up. Feel free to leave comments, suggestions of other things you'd like to see in the future. And uh, go out and have your own adventures and enjoy life. Till next time, this has been Uncle Jimmy with Jimmy's Train Station and Travel Adventures. Till next time, goodbye.